Have you ever been involved in a case of mistaken identity? I wonder if you've ever found yourself down the street somewhere and, uh, and you see someone from behind that you know and you, you shout out to them and wave at them and then when they turn around you realise it wasn't who you thought it was. Or perhaps it's a car that's passing and you wave furiously at them and you wonder why the people inside aren't waving back. And then when the reflection clears across the windscreen, you discover it wasn't who you thought it was. I had a bit of a problem with that the other week. I came into Songs to Practice late after I'd been in a school governor's meeting uh, and I saw who I thought was Molly across the hall and I thought, Molly looks a bit different tonight which was when I discovered that it was not Molly at all. It was Margaret, her twin sister, who'd come to visit. And uh, when I saw Molly a little bit later, I put the two and two together. I was also involved in a case of mistaken identity myself. A, a couple of weeks ago, I was coming out of the quarters um, after lunch, going back to the hall, uh, and a lady was coming down the path that led to the leads to the four houses where our quarters are, uh, waving furiously at me and smiling at me and hollering at me. And I thought... I don't think I know who you are. Um, but she had a package in her hand, and I, so I thought, well, perhaps she's a, a courier who's, who's come to drop her package off, and she's just waving at me to kind of stop and stay near the front door so that I can take the package and put it inside before I go on to wherever I'm going. But as she got closer, she realised that I wasn't who she thought I was. She was coming to the next door neighbour, and she thought it was him who'd come out of the door and was waving furiously at him because the sun was in her eyes and she couldn't really see. A case of mistaken identity. It can be embarrassing for all concerned. There was once a woman who uh, took up a job, uh, a new career as a security guard, and it came to her first week of uh, late night shifts and she rather naively thought that the company wouldn't send her out on patrol in the middle of the night. But actually uh, they assigned her to a factory site in quite a dangerous area of the town. So off she went and she'd done a couple of um, perimeter walks around the site but it was beginning to creep her out the the wind was kind of blowing through the factory and making it creak uh, and she knew that this was a dangerous area of town where there were uh, drugs and gangs and all sorts of things going on in the end on about the third time round the perimeter she she got the heebie-jeebies and and ran all the way back to her cabin office and slammed the door behind her and then locked double locked it so that she would be safe it took her a good couple of hours and more than a few coffees for her to calm down and, and to start to feel normal again. And it was at that moment that there was a rap on the office window and this, this dirty, unkempt, scruffy old man with uh, a cigarette hanging out of her mouth was banging on the window while she was totally freaked out by this. And so she phoned the police straight away. And, and to be fair, they were with her in a couple of minutes. Uh, she could see them talking to the man outside. And then there was a rap on the door and the police wanted to be let in. So she, she let them in. And it was then that she discovered that the dirty, scruffy, unkempt old man with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth was in fact her new boss, who she'd never met. Fortunately, it turned out that he had quite a sense of humour and they laughed about it and she kept her job. Yep, cases of mistaken identity can be embarrassing. When it comes to deciding on the identity of Jesus, who Jesus is, deciding on his identi identity and getting that wrong isn't just embarrassing, it's, it's life-changing. Taking a decision on who Jesus is determines our destiny for the rest of our lives. Some people think that Jesus is just a human being, a, a historical figure and nothing more. Some would perhaps go a little further and say, well, yes, he was a man, he's, he was a historical figure, but he was also a good, a good moral teacher. And actually, if the world followed some of the things he taught, you know, and was a little bit more loving and a little bit more kind, then the world would be in a better place. Some people say that anyone who comes along and claims to be the son of God has to be mad. That's the only explanation. Uh, and actually, some would go even further and say... So a man like that, a man like Jesus, is dangerous because people follow him as we as we see and, and think he really is the Son of God and, and act accordingly, and that's dangerous. Deciding on Jesus and who he is determines the destiny for the rest of our lives.
A little bit earlier in our worship, Patrick shared with us words from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, the, the, the story of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, in that story, we see that Jesus knew what his identity was. In verse 5, Matthew says, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Now, that might seem a bit strange, but the donkey and the colt reveal who Jesus is and what his mission is really all about. The words that Matthew uses come from the prophet Zechariah, and Zechariah describes the the Messiah, the the anointed one, this, this great king, as being humble, riding on a donkey, on a on a donkey's colt. In contrast to the to the arrogance and the violence of the earthly authorities around them at the time, Zechariah says that Israel's king will be lowly, will be bowed down, will be full of suffering that the Messiah will be a suffering servant, but a sovereign Lord. In staging this triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Jesus was claiming to be that Messiah, to be God's Messiah, to be the one that Zechariah had prophesied about, the anointed one, the one who in his humility, in his bowing down, in his being full of suffering, in, in his being the servant the one who commanded the highest place. What was Jerusalem's response to this procession into the city? Well, verses 10 and 11 say, the entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked? Who is this? Now, that's not a surprising question, is it, really? When you picture the scene in your mind, it's a pretty weird procession, isn't it? To, to have a man, this, this king of the Jews, this, this king, this, this man who is claiming to be God's Messiah, riding into the city not on a horse, but on a donkey, on a donkey's colt. It, it would be like the, the, you know, the British monarch uh, choosing to ride down the mall towards I don't know, trooping the colour or something like that, riding on a donkey rather than on a horse or in a gold carriage. It's not a surprising question. Who is this? The Bible says that Jerusalem was in uproar. This, this word uproar gives us a sense of being stirred up, of, uh, of being quaked, of, of it being a, a seismic event. Which reminds us of the beginning of Matthew's Gospel. At Jesus' birth, that was confirmed to Herod by the wise men that travelled from the east, uh, the Bible tells us that the entire city had been disturbed. And here, towards the end of the life, as Jesus of his life, as Jesus rides into Jerusalem, Jesus is disturbing the city once again. Who is it, they ask, that generates such obedience in his followers that they go to a neighbouring village, find a donkey and bring it to him without questioning, what on earth are you doing, Jesus? Who is it that the crowds cheer, carpeting the road with their coats and their palm branches, shouting out, Hosanna, God save us? Who is it that they dare to call the son of David? Who is it that they claim comes? In the name of the Lord. It, it, it's not a surprising question. Who is this? Is he a lunatic? A fool? A false teacher? Or, or is he really the Messiah? The Son of God? God's anointed one? Deciding who Jesus was determined the crowd's destiny. They proclaimed him a prophet in verses 10 and 11. The crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They proclaimed him a prophet, but a few days later, they turned on him, shouted crucify, and encouraged the Jewish and the Roman authorities to simply put him to death. Who is this? We must answer this question for ourselves. 
This is how C.S. Lewis puts it in Mere Christianity. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronising nonsense about his being a great human teacher. Who is this? We have to answer the question for ourselves. With Jesus, it's all or nothing. Will will you acknowledge him as king or not receive him at all? Is Jesus a liar? Just a a figure of history who, who made outrageous and untrue claims about himself? Is he a madman, some kind of crazy prophet with with delusions of grandeur? Or is he Lord? Is he Messiah? Is he the Son of God? Is he God himself? Answer these questions for yourselves this morning. Who is it that transforms people's lives? Surely only Christ can do that. Who is it that heals broken relationships? Fundamentally only Christ can do that. Who is it that brings hope and peace into the most tragic situations, including the one that the world is going through at the moment? Surely it is only Christ who can do that? Who is it that brings us hope this Easter? If your answer is the Lord Jesus, then there really is no other choice but for us to submit to his authority. If Jesus really is Lord, then Jesus has absolute authority over everything. He has authority over our bodies. He has authority over our credit cards. He has authority over our desires. He has authority over what we look at on our TVs and our phones. He has authority over what we eat and drink and how we work at school or in the office or as we are at the moment at home. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus today? Can you answer that question, who is this? Are you ready to wave your palm branches with the crowd? Are you ready to sing and shout Hosanna? Are you ready to accept his lordship in your life, his sovereignty over your life? Then put your destiny in his hands right now. We're going to sing together this beautiful song that says the lord is king i own his power his right to rule each day and hour i own his claim on heart and will and uh, and his demands i would fulfill and as we sing through these verses there are various parts of our lives that are brought up our hands our feet our will our lips every part of us must be submitted to this jesus who is lord who is jesus he is the lord the christ Claim him for that today.